Hello friends, my name is Steve Guttenberg and I am the Audiophiliac and yes, I do. I do review some really expensive gear on this channel from time to time. Most of the time though, it's in the mid-range, you know, it's not crazy expensive, it's not super affordable, it's in the middle. But today, I want to do a product that I think is crazy affordable for what you get. And the product is the Dayton Audio HTA 100 Hybrid Integrated Amplifier. Before I go any further, I don't want to forget to say this. This is not the HTA 100 BT. That's a different model. I'm doing the HTA 100. And uh, first of all, <laughs> I think it looks really cool and it feels great. It's a very well put together product for the money. Oh, the money, yes, the price is $200. And $30. And I got to say that most of my friends that came by while I was working on the amplifier, I asked them to guess what it was after they listened to it a little bit and touched the controls and felt it and everything. I said, guess how much this is? No one guessed the price. Most of them were saying $400, $450, one said $500. No, it's $230. Now, yet yeah, the tubes, there's four tubes in it. And the tubes are doing the, the work of the preamplifier. Now the power amplifier, ah, that's where it gets really interesting. The power amplifier is not a class D amp. No, it is a class AB amplifier. The, the tubes used in the design, by the way, are unusual. I've never heard these before. It is a 6F2, there's two of those, and a 6U1. There's also two of those. So anyway, they're unusual, but they are not expensive tubes. They are very affordable, easy to find tubes. The power rating is 50 watts a channel into four ohms. And let's stop right there and consider that. You will not see, or I can't think of any products at this price that can drive four ohms safely. This one can, and I definitely put it through its paces with low impedance speeds, as you will soon hear all about. But yeah, so it's 50 watts channel into forms. They do not supply an 8 ohm power rating for some reason. But if you do the math, that would usually work out to 25 or 30 watts a channel into 8 ohms. But anyway, that's what it is. Let's look at the back panel and check out its connectivity. There is a moving magnet input, auxiliary input, Bluetooth 5.0. For digital, there's coax, uh, optical, and USB. There's also a subwoofer output and a nice set of binding posts, which is rare because usually in amplifiers in this price range, binding posts are not a given. Usually there's, there could be spring clipped connectors, which are definitely not my favorites. This one has a pretty nice set of binding posts. Also back there is a fan, a cooling fan, which was very quiet. I never heard any noise from the cooling fan. Up front, there's a 6.3 millimeter headphone jack and bass and treble controls and those very cute meters. Why they're there, I don't know, but they look really nice. What's missing? <laughs> One very important feature that isn't there and that is a remote control. There is no remote and I understand that that is a deal breaker for some of you guys and I fully understand. But that's what this is. Although, you know, I'm thinking that considering its small size, this might be a desktop amplifier for some of you, in which case we'll be sitting right there in front of it and you can turn the knob. And the knob feel is actually, again, pretty darn nice for the money. Oh, one thing you can't see, and that is the warranty. The warranty runs to five years. That is extremely rare for a product like this in this price range. The listening session started with the amplifier hooked up to the Klipsch RP600M Mark II, which are horn speakers, very easy to drive, and I was playing Aphex Twin. And I was playing it pretty freaking loud, and yes, it sounded really good. It sounded fun. It had a lot of energy, a lot of texture, a lot of detail, and yeah. Oh, and by the way, for all of my listening tests, I was using the internal DACs, either using the optical input or the coax input. I did not use any external DACs. Always relied on the ones inside. And so yeah, Aphex Twin <laughs> definitely was doing its job. It's fun music. It has a lot of deep bass. These speakers, if you place them properly, uh, do make a fair amount of bass because they're not that small. 
But when I played some vinyl, the only time I strayed from digital, I did play some vinyl to try out the moving magnet input. And I would say, mm, no, it sounded too thin. Mm, no, not happening. I cannot recommend using that unless in a pinch. You know, it was one of those in a pinch. Uh, the phono, I mean the headphone input, that sounded really nice with these uh, Sennheiser Mastrop HD 580, 58X headphones. No problem. Smooth. These are not the easiest to drive headphones, but the HDA 100 was sailing right through, like butter, as we used to say. No problem. I definitely recommend. Uh, if, you, if you're into headphones, this amp will not disappoint. Oh, and back on speakers, continue with the uh, Aphex Twin. Uh, the mix features a lot of out of phase information in the mix, which translates to a very big and wide forward sound stage. To continue, I popped in the Bowers & Wilkins 607 S2 stand mount speakers. And I played this album by Can, The Lost Tapes. It's actually three CDs. It's, and the thing about Can that I absolutely love is their rhythm. They're just rhythmically alive. This is mostly instrumental music, a lot of intentional distortion, a lot of fuzz. It's very abstract. There's collage, there's great guitars, but it's the rhythm that just moves. And one of the things I noticed about the soundscape coming out of the speakers was that it wasn't just that it was wide. It was really tall. I mean, the speakers are down here and the soundstage was up there. And it's just like, created this wall of sound from the 607 S2s that really struck me. In other words, it wasn't holding anything back. If you're one of those people that are concerned that the 607 is a tad bright, well, no problem. That's what the tone controls are for. So you could nudge those down. I did. I nudged them down a bit. And yeah, it was a little easier on the ears, although I felt like I was missing some detail and clarity. But anyway, it's a season to taste deal. Tone controls are there and they're meant to be used if you want to, so don't hesitate. You know, don't be inhibited about messing around the tone controls and see what you get. For a comparison amplifier, I went with this one, the Emotiva BaseX A100. It's a beast, actually. <laughs> it has a huge toroidal transformer in there. It's very much solid state. As I, as I listened, I really came to feel that the BaseX A100 is a more detailed, clear, more dynamic sounding amplifier than the HTA100. That much was clear. And this was with Aphex Twin and Can. Yeah, it's a higher energy amp. Bass control is tighter, more impactful with the BaseX A100. But I kind of missed the sweetness and the warmth that I was getting out of the HT100. It's prettier sounding. It's nicer sounding. It's less vivid. It dials it back a bit, but in a nice way. It's a very easy to listen to amplifier. So what I'm saying here is, if you're chasing resolution and detail and clarity, you should probably stick with uh, solid state designs. So at this point, I wanted to present a bigger challenge to the HTA100 and use, yeah, it was kind of cruel in a way, but yeah, I wanted to use the Magnapan LRS Plus ribbon speakers. Now these are low sensitivity, low impedance speakers, meaning they draw a lot of current from an amplifier. Could the humble little HTA100 pull it off? And the answer is sort of, a bit. I'm not saying this is an ideal marriage. What I'm saying is with quieter music, acoustic music, not played very loud, in a smallish room, it'll work. It's fine. But when I played, you know, went back to Aphex Twin and Can and, and Led Zeppelin and stuff, no, it just it wasn't really cutting it. But I was kind of impressed in what it could do reasonably well. So maybe it's kind of a starter amplifier if someone's really pushing to get the LRS and their, their funds are limited, you might find other uses for this amplifier down the road as you get a better amp for the LRS Plus. But what I'm saying is it did better than expected. And that's that might be enough in this case. So yeah, but moving back to where we started this with speakers like the Klipsch and the Bowers and Wilkins and other smaller stand mount speakers or smaller towers, this amp will really surprise you with its beauty, which is a way of saying, oh, let's just segue right into 
So Steve, what do you really think of the Dayton Audio HTA100 integrated amplifier? Well, I hate to sound too repetitive, but for $230, you get a lot of amplifier for your money in terms of the features and just the sound of it and, and living with a tube amplifier that's not going to break the bank. And by the way, those little tubes are not expensive tubes, not, not at all, but like $5, $8, $10. They're cheap tubes and they probably will last thousands of hours. But anyway, it was the sound of the amp with those speakers, with the clips, and with, with the Bowers and Wilkins, it just kind of, yeah, I thought this is a nice little amplifier. And it sounded great with headphones, so you could use it as a headphone amp, you could use it on a desktop. That might be one of the more like logical places to put something as small as this. So yeah, I am very happy with what Dayton Audio has presented here. Yeah, I think this is a winner with those qualifications that I listed in the review itself. And now it is time for, yeah, you've been waiting for it, the Audiophiliac Viewer System of the Day. This system comes to us from Kent, and he is an architect. He calls it a rather eclectic system. The turntable is a Micro Seki DDX1000 with a Wilson Binesh Act 1 arm and an Ornithon Blue cartridge. Phono preamp, Bell Canto Phono 3. The preamp uh, DAC is a Class A CP800. There's a couple of amplifiers, a Jeff Rowland Model 201, and a KR Audio Antiers VTA88. The speakers are Talon Peregrines, and they are on sound anchor stands. Sub is a Velodyne DD 15-incher. Multi-format player Oppo BDP-93 and a Sony CDP-7200, that's a CD player. Power conditioning is by Richard Gray, it's a 400 Pro. The equipment stands and the small Jeff Beck copper sculpture is by Kent. Thanks, man. All right, we are back again. My name is Steve Guttenberg and I am the Audiophiliac. If you like what I'm doing here on the channel, please consider contributing to my Patreon. To do so is super easy to do. The address is on the screen. And I will say that people who are the, the patrons have more direct access to me to ask me questions and that sort of thing. But anyway, look at what's on the page and you can decide for yourself. And as I mentioned a lot recently, you can join for a couple of months and then jump off where some people stick around literally for years. If you like what I'm doing here on the channel, please consider subscribing and hit the like button on any videos of mine that you actually <laughs> do like. If you don't like them, it's okay. We'll, we can still be friends. And with that, I can say, yeah, my work here is at last 100% complete. Hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.